Uh, who of you thinks that front end development has become more complex in the five years, last five years? <laughs> okay. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, I think uh, everyone probably heard the term JavaScript critique, and uh, 2015 was the year of JavaScript critique. Uh, it's based on an article by Eric Clemens, and it's about the, uh, the um, variety of tools we use uh, that we use so many tools. I think especially the React community is uh, really tool driven, and uh, probably Webpack is also uh, um, a source of this. Um, uh, yeah, <laughs> criticism. <laughs> so, oh. just to check the fatigue. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. Um, Yes, and we have a lot of tools. Uh, it's great. <laughs> uh, I tried to collect some tools. Uh, there's also the old Webpack logo. <laughs> and um, yeah, and we, uh, we had a lot of time to create these tools. And now um, I think that uh, it's pretty, um, it can be pretty overwhelming for a lot of uh, beginners. And um, I think we still need to uh, validate if we need the tools. Uh, and so that's, that was in the end of 2015. And uh, now it's 2017, so we're in the future, right? We have new web technologies. And how do these new web technologies shape our tools? So for instance, we have HTTP2 uh, now with the, uh, the most recent browser versions of all the major browsers uh, implement. 73% implement HTTP2. With ES2015, it's even more, um, and web components also rising percentage. And um, these new technologies try to address some of the problems that we, uh, uh, why we are using tools to uh, to overcome these problems. So my talk is about the future of front-end tooling, how uh, how our tools will change. Do we even need the tools? We have to uh, rethink that again. I'm Johannes Ewald. I uh, found a company with my friends. It's called Pyrigon. And that's my Twitter handle. It's with 3N because 2N was already taken. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> yes. And uh, I'm also a member of the Webpack core team. We released Webpack 2 yesterday. Yay. <laughs> <laughs> It was a lot of work, but I think uh, the, the change is not too bad for you. So you have to change a little bit in the config files, but it's not like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's not like Angular 2, 1 to 2. <laughs> so don't worry, it's easy. <laughs> um, yeah, let's start with one new technology, ES 2015 modules. Probably, uh, I guess a lot of people know a lot about these modules here, but I think it's uh, it's very important to to know, know all the um, small things about these modules because uh, it's really a nice syntax and um, everyone should know that. <laughs> so uh, we have export default, and uh, if we import stuff, it's really easy. Uh, the TS39 even tried to encourage uh, to only export one thing, so it's, that's why it's so easy to uh, import the default export. And I think we should uh, really use that. And um, in contrast to CommonJS, which uh, Node uses, and um, it looks really familiar, like um, you can to, uh, translate it directly. They look similar, but there are two important difference, differences that everyone should know. <laughs> In CommonJS, you can do dynamic imports because it's just a regular function. So if you have a variable and you require path to A, whatever, it's totally valid because it's only evaluated on runtime, and you can do that. But with ES2015, that's not possible because uh, all the imports are resolved before the code is actually uh, executed. And if you have used Webpack, you already know that this is also a problem for Webpack. 
because you can't analyze uh, the dynamic imports, you can't analyze it statically. Uh, just by reading the source code, you need to execute it to know the real path. And another important thing is that uh, CommonJS exports copies of values. So for instance, if you have a number and you, uh, you export it, and you have a function that changes the, the number, then all the importing uh, modules won't get the update because they get a copy of that. With objects, it's usually no problem, but uh, if you export a primitive value like numbers or strings, you will probably run into that, that you get a copy of it, not the actual thing. And with ES2015, it's different. Uh, these are live bindings, which means that in this case, you get the actual uh, reference. So you can do that. And it might, uh, it might look a, like a small distinction, but it's a very important uh, difference, a dif uh, distinction. So ES2015 modules are actually less flexible because you can't do dynamic imports. But they're also the foundation for tree shaking. So the T TC39 uh, agreed on this, uh, for instance, to make uh, static analysis possible, and also tree shaking. So how, how does tree shaking work? So if you have this module AJS, and we export a lot of uh, functions, and we just use uh, the increment function, we know that our, our program doesn't use the decrement function, because we can directly relate that import to the export here. And that's where tools can come and play and see, oh, uh, this decorant function is not used, so we don't include it into the final bundle. And then it looks like this. And in this case, it might look like a, just a small change, but uh, with uh, bigger uh, libraries, it might um, make a huge difference. For instance, if Lodash uh, exported all um, all things with ES2015 modules, you would just get the function that you are actually using. So the static nature of ES2015 modules make it possible to trace all the exports that are used. That's because of the live binding. We know that it's exactly the same. So with a static module system, how do we load things on demand? And there will be a function, it's called import, import all the things. And it's, uh, it was a proposal, but now uh, it's getting more stable. Um, and it just, it returns a promise. And when the module is loaded, then uh, the promise is resolved. And that's the way how you can do all the dynamic stuff. Uh, so. We don't have to write a string here, so a module, we could also pass a variable and it would totally be valid. But things aren't finished yet. We still have to wait to use that in production. But uh, import recently reached stage three, and now uh, they require feedback from implementations and users. But it's actually a, a little bit more complicated because import relies on very platform-specific implementations. For instance, loading modules. Like, loading modules in Node is totally diff different than in browsers, because in Node, you access the file system, and uh, a browser typically does HTTP requests. So many things need to be considered. And that's why the TC39 decided to exclude it from ES2015 and pass it on to the <laughs> W what we do, I don't know the English, how do the English people pronounce it? <laughs> I would say what we <laughs> <laughs> uh, And pass it to them and said, uh, let's create a loader standard. Um, and now they are trying to do that. And they, uh, in the first paragraph, they say the, the JavaScript loader allows host environments like Node.js and browsers to fetch and load modules on demand. It provides a hookable pipeline to allow front-end packaging solutions like Browserify, Webpack, and JSPM to hook into the loading process. And that's nice that they thought of us here, too. <laughs> so um, it, uh, they, they, uh, 
they discovered and acknowledged the need to pre-process things. So once we can load modules natively in the browser, do we even need tools like Browsify and Webpack anymore? It's a valid uh, concern, so let's discuss it. To answer this question, we should take a look at another new technology first, HTTP2. The most important feature of HTTP2 is that it's a binary protocol in contrast to HTTP1, which is text-based. So requests and responses are binary streams, and these streams are divided into frames. And since we can divide it into frames, we can also interleave them. That's why we can have multiple requests and responses on a single TCP connection, which is the real power of HTTP2. This elim eliminates uh, the problem of HTTP1, uh, best known of head of line blocking, which means that you have to wait for one request to finish to do another request. And it actually invalidates uh, some uh, best practices that we have learned, like in, for instance, bundling multiple resources into one file to avoid requests, or domain sharding. We have to rethink that again with HTTP2. Great, so let's get our, rid of the bundlers and just include our development files. Well, not so fast. <laughs> One problem is tree shaking. When there are no bundlers, no tools that analyze our source code, who's do, doing the tree shaking? So we still need, if we want to uh, benefit from tree shaking, we still need a tool that operates on a dependency graph. And the dependency graph is, uh, you know, like a model that um, Module A uses module B, and module B uses module C, and so on. Problem two is minification. So we still need a tool that does uh, minification for us, like shortening variable names and removing unused uh, code, dead code. So this still remains. It's not uh, gone with HTTP2. Another problem is compression. GZIP compression is good at removing repetition. It compresses one big file more effectively than many small files. That's also another uh, point of putting it into one file. And problem four is uh, round trip. The browser can only discover additional dependencies after re the response has been received and parsed. To illustrate that, we have the client, and the client says, give me AJS, and the server says, here you go. Then the client realizes, oh, th this AJS doesn't work without BJS, so it requests BJS, no prop, here you go. And then, so uh, it went on like this, so um, that's the round trip problem here. That's where another feature comes into play of HTTP2, it's called server push. With HTTP2, the server is able to push a resource proactively to the client. So when the client requests the resource, it is instantly available and cached, just like it was, on the, for instance, on the file system. So what do we need to provide server push? A dependency tree for each file. So for instance, that index HTML requires the app CSS and the app JS. And this is the output of um, a small small command line tool from Google, HP2 push manifest. It analyzes the HTML and discovers the dependencies. And then if you parse app CSS again, you realize, oh, in app CSS there's a URL statement and it requires the logo, for instance. So how do we get this dependency tree? Well, you could do traffic analysis using the referrer header to know that this HTML file uh, requires this CSS. Or you uh, are using tools like bundlers, which are, able, uh, which are able to figure out the dependency graph. 
again, you have a tool that knows what modules uh, are using what modules. So. Great, so let's figure out the dependency graph and push everything to the client. Not so fast. <laughs> Problem one, responsive images. We need information about the client because we don't want to push, for instance, high resolution images to small screens. Problem two, cache. We don't know uh, what the client already ha uh, has cached, so we need to know that in advance, or otherwise we would waste precious bandwidth. And there's a proposed solution for this, it's called cache digest. I don't know uh, what happened with it. Um, it was a request for change, RFC to HTTP, but uh, um, I don't know the current state of it. Another problem is authorization. So we need, uh, we can't push confidential resources to the client. Push basically requires the same authorization flow as requests. It's really important. And third, third party servers like CDNs, uh, resources <coughs> from other servers cannot be pushed because we need an initial request to it. And another problem is prioritization. If we just push everything to the client without, without any prioritization, it actually harms performance. There's a very good document on this by Google engineers. I can really recommend that. So they, they discovered that uh, there's only a small time span where push is really uh, beneficial. After that, it can actually harm the perceived performance. For instance, uh, we need to remember that CSS and fonts are render blocking, and images are not, for instance. So if we uh, are pushing images, we waste bandwidth on non-render blocking things, and this harms the perceived performance. And that's why HTTP2 provides a way to weigh each stream and pause, uh, pause resume, and uh, cancel a stream. But the problem is a good implementation that takes everything into account is very challenging and complex. And it turns out that with HTTP 1, the head of line blocking actually prevented this kind of wrong prioritization. We just needed to reference all the assets plus some metadata, like image dimensions in the intended order. That's what we learned all the, in the past years, like put your uh, CSS uh, in the head and try to uh, reference the font, font files as soon as possible. And if we specify the dimensions, the browser can already start the layout without knowing the actual image. Which brings us to the last uh, new technology, web components. The original vision of web components, it's already a little bit old. You can, <laughs> you can read that. You can think of web components as reusable user interface widgets that are created using open web technology. They are part of the browser, and so they do not need external libraries like jQuery or Jojo. <laughs> an existing web component can be used without writing code simply by adding an import statement to an HTML page. This is from the Mozilla Developer Network, the definition of web components. Uh, as you might notice that it's, it already feels a little bit old. That's because web components uh, are, I don't know how long, for five, six years. Uh, people try to specify it and it's really hard to do it right. But it actually is a fuzzy term because it refers to four different technologies. First we have HTML templates, we have custom elements, we have the Shadow DOM, and we have HTML imports. <coughs> so we need to distinguish that. And custom elements, HTML imports, and the Shadow DOM have already gone through several revisions, which makes finding up-to-date information kind of difficult. You get a lot of outdated information, so you need to be careful there. 
And Mozilla and Microsoft even decided to pause development on HTML imports entirely until the loader standard has been finished. So they, they said there's too much overlap. We need to sort that out uh, before. So let's start with the first technology, HTML templates. They provide a way to define HTML fragments that are not parsed, uh, that are parsed but not in interpreted. So the templates are init by default, which means that no markup is displayed, no styles are applied, no images are loaded, no JavaScript is executed, and the inner contents are invisible to selectors. And you can access this, uh, this DOM node via template.content, and then you can import it into the DOM to get real DOM nodes. Custom elements uh, is a JavaScript API to register a custom implementation for arbitrary elements. And the current proposal uh, looks like this. You can define your own button, for instance, and it, it extends the HTML button element. And then you get lifecycle hoops like uh, the constructor, connected callback, uh, which means that uh, it's, it has been inserted into the DOM, disconnected callback, um, and attribute change callback, for instance. And then you define your, uh, your yeah, you define your element and say, if I use my button, I want to use that implementation here. And it will also be possible to customize <laughs> built-in tags, and it looks like this. You say that you want to extend the native button, and then when you reference it, you need to use the, the is attribute here. Button is my button. <coughs> The shadow DOM encapsulates and hides elements, styles, and events behind a single element. And it also describes how content of the document tree is, they call it, transcluded into the sh shadow tree. Um, transcluded is the same as in React with the children uh, prop. And uh, it's a little bit more code, but um, the basic idea is that you have slots here, which you also can name. And, and you can create a shadow root here in, inside the, the for loop. And then uh, styles won't leak out into other parts of the DOM. And that's a way how you can define encapsulated components. The last technology is HTML imports. And as I already said, this is cu uh, currently uh, on pause uh, in Firefox and Edge. They don't develop it currently. They wait for the loader spec. But HTML imports is a way to import other HTML documents into the current one, including all the templates, styles, and scripts. It's like the vision that you don't, uh, you, you don't need to think about it, just include the, uh, the link and everything will work. So if you have uh, an external document like this, uh, no, sorry, if you have, uh, if, uh, this is your uh, index HTML, for instance, and you include a link tag here and say, I want to use the blog post HTML, which brings its own styles, its own JavaScript, and then uh, you import it, and then the uh, the styles are applied to the document, and scripts are executed. And but you still, of course, need to say where you want to include it into the DOM. Great. So let's get rid of all the frameworks and just write native co web components. Well, not so fast. Problem one: data flow. With web components, data is usually provided as strings via attributes on the shadow host. And I think this will work for simple components, but not for more complex ones like higher order components. So I don't want to write uh, and code my JSON this way here. <laughs> that would be awful. 
Second problem is that uh, web co components don't offer a declarative way to describe DOM manipulations. And with uh, React, we, we uh, learned the benefits of um, describing declaratively. So do we really want to go back to manual, manual DOM manipulation? Problem three, um, while encapsulation is a good thing, we want to hide the implementation details. Details. We don't want actually true self-contained web components from different sources. For instance, if we have a lot of um, components and the one is using React and the other one is using Angular and uh, or other bigger uh, or libraries, we might end up with multiple versions of the same uh, library. So we don't actually want that. We also have uh, the global namespace. With HTML imports, the mistakes of the past are repeated. For instance, the styles still need to pre be prefixed, and scripts are just uh, uh, executed in the global namespace. So all the problems are still there. We also have the flash of unstyled content. So if you if fail to deliver the implementation of a custom element fast enough, the browser will uh, display the custom element as unknown element. So there's another um, source of problems. And we don't have really a progressive enhancement because web components are defined by JavaScript. And if something goes wrong, our app will be broken. So uh, it's not really the web way where you all, where if, you, if you've done it uh, right, then the web way is to always fall back to something that works. And uh, with web components, we give up this, uh, this concept. And if, if something breaks, the whole page might, uh, might be broken. Of course, that's true for every single page application, but for instance, if you use server-side rendering also, uh, we always can fall back to a mode that uh, works for every user. So my conclusion, will ES 2015 modules change the way we work? Yes. Finally, a universal module format for JavaScript. <laughs> it was a long way, and I'm really happy that uh, now we have a universal module format. It avoids typical problems like namespace conflicts. Uh, I think it's even one of the best uh, module systems I've used so far. It enables tree shaking through static analysis. And I think it's a good idea to encapsulate the platform semantics, like um, what implementation you need for Node and what for, for the browser, it is encapsulated in loader implementations. So it, it was good that they didn't define it in the TC39. It has nothing to do with the language itself. It's a concern of the host environment. Will HTTP2 change the way we work? Yes, binary streams invalidate formal best practices. We have to rethink that. We have a more fine-grained control over optimization. And so push provides a new way to deliver resources separately. But in order to leverage streams and server push, we need to weigh and, con and control these streams. We need sophisticated server implementations that take everything into account. We need tools that feed these servers with valuable information about our web app. And of course, we need careful and, and automated testing. And when in doubt, we should stick to the old practices where appropriate. Oh. Uh, <laughs> crazy. <laughs> Blank slide. I think uh, it's about web components. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, will they change the way we work? Uh, yes. <laughs> they provide new DOM primitives for future frameworks. They make the platform itself more customizable. I think it's a good idea to, for instance, uh, many browsers, um, uh, I think all major browsers um, implemented the video tag with a custom element. So you can actually inspect how the video element works inside the browser. And it's a good way that uh, they 
um, they use internal uh, in order to, to provide internal features they use laptop technologies so they give us the same power they have the browser vendors um, and I think uh, web components are really useful for sharing leaf components so if you have your component tree uh, and for instance you have the date picker is a typical problem uh, you don't want to write a React date picker, uh, Angular date picker. It would be nice to have a component that works in all frameworks. So these are the leaf components. But they don't provide tools to actually compose them for a more complex web application. And they don't provide ways to deliver these components efficiently. Like, um, I have I have doubts that HTML imports will solve that for us. And they can also make the platform itself more fragile. So we need to be aware of that. I think progressive enhancement is still a thing we should, a thing we should think about. So how will front-end development look like in the next years? I think we will use tools like Babel, PostCSS, and ESLint that expose hackable ASTs. And provide plugins and presets. I think uh, Babel showed us the way um, how to do that, and uh, it's really easy to use it. Languages with explicit, explicit exports and imports to avoid namespace collisions. For instance, the, uh, the uh, CSS modules or CSS in JavaScript is generally a way to leverage these. Uh, these module systems with named exports and imports. And these languages will allow static analysis. That's why I think uh, ES 2015 modules are so uh, important and good, because we can analyze them by just reading the source code. We will use languages like JSX that embed other languages into ES 2015. And bundlers that compose ES2015 modules. And tree shake unused parts. We will use tools that analyze the critical rendering path. So this tool analyzes what assets are needed to display the first screen on the uh, in the browser. And optimize for the first meaningful paint. And I think server-side rendering as a fallback strategy, if anything goes wrong, to en uh, enable progressive enhancement is still a thing, and we should um, discover more things there. So let's go. <laughs> Thank you. You want to do Q and A? Yeah. yeah. Cool. Any questions? Just raise your hand. So what do you think about server-side rendering fallbacks uh, in, like in general? How is it even possible if you don't have JavaScript on the server? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what, what's your goal? Like, what, what do you think about like how it can be done still? Or is it, is it unbearable? Um, I haven't thought about that. For me, uh, I'm... I'm uh, in the node scope, so I didn't think about uh, Python or, or Java. Um, maybe there, there's, uh, for instance, if you're using Elm and they will uh, compile to WebAssembly someday, maybe there's uh, a way how to use the same code. Um, but um, I think that's the power of using uh, Node that you can actually run the same code. So and. There's no way to, no, no real way to do that, because we are still restricted or how uh, to use JavaScript in the browser. Yes. Um, what's next for Webpack? What's what's Webpack <laughs> free looking like? <laughs> um, well. <laughs> Just give it a break. <laughs> <laughs> no. Uh, um, um, we have a we have a voting page where where people can vote for the most important features uh, that people think are very important, and I think uh, the scope collapsing feature that Rollup uh, brought up is um, 
is uh, very, uh, very important because um, it has been proven that um, that the execution speed in the browser is actually better if you don't uh, have a lot of function closures and if you put everything into one scope, you get better execution speed and smaller bundles and I think that's uh, really important, especially on mobile. Um, personally, I really strive for um, making Webpack easier, but I haven't quite figured it out. <laughs> um, um, uh, it's, it's strange that, for instance, Create React App, they have this plugin to make uh, Webpack error messages friendly, and I totally understand that. And th these are small steps, for instance, to um, improve Webpack for newcomers. And that's my personal goal, but uh, my current time is really limited. So that's why uh, I don't know if, if I can make that, but I have to convince the others to, to do it. <laughs> Um, no, uh, you still have the problem that, for instance, uh, the uh, the tag itself you need to prefix it. So maybe I don't know. Maybe we won't uh, if you want to ship a component for uh, like you, if you want to publish it on npm, it's probably not a good idea to use custom elements dot define because then you say that this component needs to be uh, um, used with exactly this um, tag name. So there. In regards of tag names, you still have the global namespace. But uh, yes, Sh uh, Shadow DOM uh, will will address uh, some things. Um, I think you you need to have JavaScript to define a uh, custom element. Huh? Yeah. So that means like there is no no server side fallback. Um, I think um, I think it would be possible to uh, to write a, a tool that um, that makes it server side renderable. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that's that would be a real cool idea. So that you. Yeah. Yeah. Ah. Okay. Yeah. That, that's uh, that's one thing I really don't like about web components that. That you, um, if you use the shadow DOM, for instance, you can't use it de declaratively. Yeah, that's true. And they they had an issue about that. I hope they are discussing it because I would really love to use it declaratively without yeah. executing JavaScript. Or even like uh, like G6 does some abstraction that you can just convert to, you know, like to just compile to any language you would like to. Yeah. So you have some spec like. Yeah, but I think it's currently uh, it would be good enough to be web compatible, but that's really a problem of the Shadow DOM that you um, you can't server uh, render it on server side because then everything leaks again. So probably if you compile the C CSS class names again with yeah, CSS so modules. Yeah. Uh, in regard of using Shadow DOM as, as, a, an, as an abstraction for styles that would be like compatible, like web standard compatible, but it doesn't work on server side and it, it's one of the requirements of Flex.js, so they can't leverage it right now. And yeah. So they, they came up with something custom, which is also hacked, but it somehow works. <laughs> but we really wanted to use Shadow DOM to, to do the work, but they can't. Any other questions? All right, then let's do a 10-minute break, and we come back for React Fiber. Okay.